Hello everyone, I'm Mrs. Sherman. Welcome to Homemaking Radio. Hope you get a few things done while you listen, and welcome to the manse. Now today I am not prepared, but I had the time to come and talk to you, so I'm just going to start with the usual thing is if you aren't ready yet to do your homemaking, to get ready and concentrate on your appearance so that it satisfies you, so that it makes you feel uplifted and happy. Many times we neglect our appearance because we think that no one's going to see us and it doesn't matter. But there's something about washing and combing and dressing that makes us feel better and more focused. And so I would say also that appearance is, uh, affects people. If you do see someone, if you do see yourself in the window or the mirror, it does have an effect on you. And you don't know that you won't see anyone. How many of you have people that are delivering things to the door or uh, coming to see you or arranging to see you or places you have to go? So your appearance as a homemaker should be a number one priority. And if you do answer the door, you are an ambassador for homemaking, for the home, for the family. And you have to think about what kind of impression you're making for that role in life Uh, because who would desire a role in life where you didn't really care so this is part of the reason is your motivation and uh, so I also want to talk continue talking a little bit about self-care because caregivers are homemakers I have a friend that's a full-time caregiver she tells me all kinds of things and I just remembered something that I heard from a, I believe he was a, what you used to call a naturopath doctor, and I heard him on the radio many years ago in, uh, I believe, the early 70s. And I'll always remember how he was talking about uh, people drinking too much coffee and how you can actually enjoy coffee without drinking much of it. And he suggested, and I I put this along with self-care too, because I have learned with food preparation that it's better to prepare your own so that you can start getting your uh, digestive system ready. And part of it is the uh, chopping and preparing of the food and the, the cooking it, and it gets the saliva glands going, it gets your eyes onto the food and the deliciousness of it and you get the smell and then you get to eat it. Uh, That is one thing we miss, you know, when we go somewhere else to eat. I was unfortunately listening (laughs) to a video talking about how uh, restaurant foods uh, can harm your health (laughs) and so now I'm more aware of how important it is to prepare your food at home. And so one of the things that this doctor said is if you like coffee go out and get the top brand most exclusive organic uh, expensive brand of coffee and just get a little bit you know how you can go and get a little bag and fill it up with the coffee beans and weigh it and just get a little bit but get the best bring it home and with a a hand coffee grinder the one with the little drawer in it grind up enough for one cup and then pour it through a little filter that's just for one cup and but he said open the little drawer when all when it's all ground up open the little drawer and then pull it past your nose and smell it before you pour it into the filter and then as you pour hot water into the little filter just do it a little bit at a time stop and smell and a little till you get your cup and then Port, he said use a small cup like he called it a demi toss cup just a real small cup that you would uh, drink espresso in and he said that would be all you would need if you would use that process and our problem I think with a lot of the uh, uneasiness that people feel especially the homemaker is not going through processes to get something and I believe there was a book I'm trying to think of what the name of it was. It Greater Health God's Way by Stormy or Martian, and she uh, said that where we used to go out to the garden and pick our vegetables for the salad or our peas or whatever we had out there, we had the effort to go out there. You're using up 
energy and calories to go out there and you get to pick it and, and of course the scent the aroma is wonderful and you bring it in and it takes a while you've got to peel chop cook and it takes a while whereas now we're missing the process because you take a cart in the grocery store and you put things in it and it takes less time and in the meantime uh, we can load it up with a lot of foods that we wouldn't naturally go get all at once because and and then we start to gain weight because we're eating more but uh, she just had a wonderful uh, chapter in that book about getting you know getting food and going through a process where you process it yourself instead of buying it already processed and so this is one of the self-care things to have some pleasurable thing that you do that's good for the senses and there's good pleasures and bad pleasures but this would be one good thing and that's one of the reasons that I like uh, the tea the different teas and today I got in the mail a mag uh, a catalog from Tea Republic, the Republic of Tea. And uh, I found this interesting to just sit and read. Uh, it just calmed me down just reading it. And I grew up on with catalogs. That was how I got figured out a lot of things was through catalogs, how things are used, how you would order uh, things for your house, towels and sheets and and different things and they would have pictures there that gave me an idea how you would use it as a matter of fact one of my friends said what what you need to teach is tell people to get a dwelling place tell young people to get a place to live and fix it up and that's that's what they do that's what you do but anyway so this started out with a, a sample of tea here and then I flipped over to some of the other places and found it most delightful because you know how I like uh, the tins, these these tall, elegant tins. So I wanted to flip over to the section that I, and I'm just reading it page by page because of the descriptions are so entertaining. It's like getting a, a book. So here are some of their health teas, their green teas. Digestion, detox green, lean green, serenity, brain boost, and immunity. Oh, I need that brain boost. Brain boost. It says it can help keep memory sharp, enjoy the deep berry flavor of the black currants, and a touch of honey in this refreshing cup. Um, so then they have another one called the classic white teas, and I enjoyed reading about those. There's honey mango, silver rain, emperor's white, ginger peach, orange blossom, and cucumber mint. Let's see what the silver rain is. The delicate white tea steeps a crisp and refreshing cup with hints of honey and toasty sweetness. Okay, now let's go over here to one that I was quite... They also have a lot of immunity wellness teas, but I love the... They've got organic elderberry. I love the tins. That's that's what it's all about for me. It's having. I need a whole shelf of tins, but look what I found was the dessert teas. So they're not really teas. They are what's called tisanes or herbals. And so this one was called Carrot Cake. Carrot Cake Cuppa. Okay. The satisfying combination of sweet carrots and walnuts with warm cinnamon, ginger, and nutmeg in this calorie-free delight. And the other one was Strawberry Shortcake. Strawberry Shortcake. I like the tins and I like the color. This blend of natural sweet strawberry and shortcake flavors steeps the perfect cup for your next tea party or any time you want something extra special. Indulge in this caffeine and calorie free strawberry shortcake tea with a base of hearty red rubus. Okay, then there's lemon chiffon, caramel vanilla, caramel vanilla, gingerbread, coconut cocoa, red velvet chocolate, and banana and chocolate. Yes, I want them all. Uh, all, you would, all I would have is a sip from some of my stealth sipping anyway. Uh, then they have strawberry chocolate, hibiscus, raspberry rose hibiscus, saffron rose. I like saffron. Saffron rose. I'll just show you some of these here. I don't know how, how I got this unless I signed up for it online. Uh, it's called Republic of Tea. Saffron Rose. This unique, sweet, savory flavor of saffron is finished with the delicate floral notes of the fresh rose petals for an ethereal sip and it's caffeine free. Then we move on and they sell blackberry sage and desert sage. I just love the sounds of those desert sage. 
and the desert is is so exciting for me and uh, I, I would wish I had time to read more of the I just sit sometimes just to unwind and let my mind relax because uh, caregivers homemakers are caregivers then you have to have these little minutes of sitting and looking at something that's relaxing and and I'll just read one one description of one tin of tea and that is all I need to do but we do need to take a minute here in a minute so I want to read about the uh, vanilla almond the smoothness of Madagascar vanilla beans takes over the first sip of this black tea sweetening the cup nutty almond follows which sends it soaring to the realms of dessert. Try a strong brew with steamed milk for a tea latte. Uh, it's amazing these descriptions, the writers, I must have, they must have to pay them well because it sounds like a romance novel. <laughs> so to top that off, I'm going to read, and I will get to the homemaking and the people part because caregivers are involved we are homemakers it's all about caregiving isn't it I'm just giving you a little time off and hope you get a few things done while you listen uh, getting you some time off from the bad news of the world and all the stress that it brings in and let's see if we can go away from this broadcast happier than when we came now that could have two meanings <laughs> happy it's over or just happier because it puts you in a better mood we hope the latter okay so this is from the book that I, I like a lot and thank you Cheryl for the beautiful bookmark um, I leave the bookmarks in the books and that's why I never have enough because I don't want to go flipping through a book to find out what I was wanting and so I just leave them there and so this was called um, and it's from a book called Tea with Jane Austen by Kim Wilson. And I love the fact that so many people are writing uh, about what they've discovered of the Jane Austen era, the Regency era, and wondered about it. And I've seen online on YouTube a lot of people are writing uh, novels based on that era, which, is, which I can understand they would do because you might not want to write about your current era if it doesn't if it doesn't turn out the way you want it to and it's so messed up and I'll read from Linda Lichter's book about why she hated the current era so much <laughs> but uh, and I have a I believe I have something else I wanted to show you and I hope it's I hope it's here goodness this it's here okay uh, so let me read from Kim Wilson's tea with Jane Austen now there aren't I did not see recipes in here but there's just a lot of history okay so tea was useful in cases of emotional distress and you know it was just a it's just the idea of sitting down and of course I've been doing tea for so long that I had forgotten what it means to people and after a few times of a lady coming over for a ladies Bible class and we have tea afterwards she said, you know, and of course I'm taking it for granted because we drink tea, and she sat down and she said, I love this time because we get to slow down, and I just really hadn't thought of it. She said, we just stop, and this is all we do. We just have tea, and we, we're quiet, and we think about what we're saying, and we, or we don't have to say anything. There's no pressure. We're drinking tea, and she said that's the thing she looks forward to the most, and uh, she's since done some pretty fantastic tea. She really wanted to get into it, so she got herself some Tea Time magazines, and she started inviting people, and they were so appreciative that it built her up, and so she continues. So I want to read to you what this woman says, Kim Wilson. Tea was useful in cases of emotional distress as well. I think we don't even stop to consider that maybe we should have a cup of tea before we start to get too upset and the other day I someone had given me a gift certificate to use online for anything I wanted uh, and it didn't have a uh, the place that I the place that it was for didn't have things that I needed but had some nice things and I wanted to buy a, a picture for one of the walls of my house uh, one of these prints you know and 
So I ordered it, I checked it twice and looked at it and ordered it and when it came I was so thrilled and I opened it up and they had sent the wrong thing. Well right away I could feel everything shutting down in my chest. I could feel my my eyes, uh, the pain in, the, in my head and uh, sinuses acting up. And so I sat, sat down, got my cup of tea and I got online and I got one of those people to chat with me and she was really nice and she fixed it I just was so disappointed and she fixed it up and uh, she said that I said okay what do I do with the print that I don't want what it was was I had ordered this pretty print of an English cottage and was so looking forward to getting it and what came was a wolf howling at the moon <laughs> it was just so different and I said, okay, well, now what do I do? And I was texting her, what do I do with the, with the wolf picture? And she said, just donate it or give it away. And so that was really nice. So well, that'll go out on my free table. And somebody in this area, I know for sure, will be so glad to get that. And uh, it just made my day. And she just substituted it, and she sent me the real picture that I wanted. And I was so happy. But I just... You know, normally, uh, back in the old days, I probably would have just had a big old meltdown and uh, been very unhappy and tense for days till I could get this straightened out. And But I did have a cup of that tea, the tisane that I had, and uh, it helped me a lot. I prayed about it, and then I did a few of these anti-anxiety um, stretches, and honestly, that helped me so much. So... Tea was useful in cases of emotional distress as well. In Northanger Abbey, Catherine Moreland is sent home abrupt, abruptly from the dreadful General Tilney's house. The first thing her mother does, noticing Catherine's pale and jaded looks, is to order tea for her. Ooh, wouldn't that be nice? Ring the bell, order the tea. You know, I have thought of uh, times when I'm very much alone here at the manse, of ringing the bell anyway <laughs> and then putting my apron on and going and get the tea and putting it here and uh, then changing roles <laughs> to the person that uh, is doing the, some of the other work. Um, in Mansfield Park, Fanny Price, oh, I do like Fanny Price, Mansfield Park and Northanger Abbey are my least favorites of Jane Austen's work, but I'm, they're becoming uh, better upon acquaintance. <laughs> Um, uh, the first thing uh, she does is uh, order Fanny Price returning home after an exhausting journey is grateful for the tea re prepared by her thoughtful sister Fanny's spirit was as much refreshed as her body her head and heart were soon the better for such well-timed kindness tea could also assist literary inspiration one of Jane Austen's favorite authors, Samuel Johnson. Yes, my Mr. S. He loves Samuel Johnson. Um, he read a lot about Samuel Johnson and laughed and laughed. He had a wry wit, and I have not read all of him, but I have read snatches of things that he wrote. Um, she called him her dear Dr. Johnson. You know that wild cat I was telling you about? It's like an unwelcome suitor. All I did was talk to it, and now it just wants to follow me around, and uh, and it disappears for long periods of time, and I have to, but because I don't want it to follow me around and get attached, I go around hedges and trees and uh, buildings to go get the mail. I serpentine to go get the mail <laughs> and to go to the uh, line, uh, you know where the uh, hangout clothes and go to the uh, meeting house I, I serpentine and try not to leave any evidence because he wants to come out and talk to me and um, and I believe that he's what they call a an owner bigamist because he probably has an owner somewhere that isn't home during the day because he's well fed and his coat is really nice no mange or anything like that and uh, then he comes over here just to hear me say hi. <laughs> um, but, and, and I don't know, uh, maybe he'll settle down somewhere else, but I imagine he's got several owners. I hope one of them isn't me. 
Fanny's spirit was as much refreshed as her body. Her head and her heart were soon the better off for such well-timed kindness. Tea could also assist literary inspiration. One of Jane Austen's favorite authors, Samuel Johnson, her dear Dr. Johnson, as she called him, was completely mad about tea. Brilliant and wickedly amusing, he described himself as a hardened and shameless tea drinker who has for twenty years diluted his meals, meals with only the infusion of this fascinating plant, whose kettle has scarcely time to cool, who with tea amuses the evening, with tea solaces the midnight, and with tea welcomes the morning. Known to drink fifteen cups at a sitting, he wrote prolifically, often late into the night, kept awake by tea. Samuel Johnson and Jane Austen were both brilliant writers, and they both loved tea. American coincidence? I think not. My daughter and granddaughter and I and a few friends are writing uh, a storyline and having so much fun with it and uh, drinking tea while we do this. We just do it online or uh, text or email, and one will write one chapter. and one. What we'll do is we write the outline first we name the characters and then uh then we start to and then we plot the the events what what there will be that will happen and then we fill them in uh as we go we fill in things we go back to the front and we fill in the introductions and and we fill in the uh, the different things that happen and we are having an enormously wonderful time with it and uh I'll tell you about it sometime. Maybe I'll get to read the story to you. Um, so, tea with that little something extra. If tea by itself didn't pro provide enough refreshment and inspiration, it could always be helped along with a little slosh of something more stimulating. <laughs> it said that after dinner, the ladies retired to the drawing room, and the gentlemen customarily sat over their wine in the living room, sometimes for hours. Uh, do you remember in Wives and Daughters, so those of you who have the, the DVD, um, where Hyacinth and Molly and uh, Cynthia stayed in the drawing room and the withdrawing room, uh, and the gentlemen, uh, the doors were closed in the dining room. And so this also goes along with what Linda Lichter said, that uh, women stayed in a group and talked about things that were important to them, and men talked about things that were important to the women. But I can see now why, why that would be done, because there have been conversations here, uh, because there'll be uh, Mr. S and, and his colleagues sitting around talking where I'm thinking, you know what, I don't need to uh, be too worried about that. They're going to solve all that, and then I can go in my sewing room and do things that I'm interested in. So, so I wanted to, I will put that away, and now I want to talk a little bit about um, a one of the things I do for homemaking that helps me if I'm if I'm here alone. Uh, if if there are a lot of people around, of course I wouldn't do it. But I like audiobooks, and I can get listen to them for free. Or you know you can always make donations to these people. Uh, but it's interesting how nice it is that they will post these. And one of the listens as I go that I've been trying to get through a book uh, by it looks like Midge M. Bella, and I will try to put uh, a link on here for you so you can go check it out. And she has a lady series, like the lady and the, you know, the lady and the, uh, the mountain house, or the lady and the, you know, and it's done in uh, what I would call the 1800s, of Victorian times, pioneer times. And what I liked, first of all, about her books, listening to them, well, she starts out with a psalm that is so calming. And then, you know, I always relax because I know, oh, this theme is going to carry out throughout her story, uh, and there's not going to be anything um, untoward or risque that I have to listen to. So that's what I like about hers. And so 
I would also like to talk about a warm-up for housekeeping and for homemaking. And I know we always remember the care of the people is more important, but you know, making the house nice is part of caring for other people. And one of the things that I like to do if I'm just not in the mood for it, um, my son wrote me a, a text this morning about uh, doing things. So I'm going to see if I can find that and read it to you. Uh, the, the difference between feeling like doing something and doing something, that was one of the reasons Sidetracked side Home Executives was written by what they called themselves the Slob Sisters, was because they wanted to get away from uh, avoiding housework and things you had to do because you didn't feel like it or you weren't in the mood, and how they could make a list and follow this list, or they had it in, on card file, um, so that no matter what came up, whether it was rain or shine, or you felt like it or you didn't feel like it, come up on this card as you rotated this card file, and you would just do it. And that way they got away from feeling uh, the feeling part, because we women are so, I, I'm really emotional, I want to, and artistic, I, I want to be in the mood to do something, you know. So I am going to see if I can read that to you. If he wrote this, and it was called How to Make Decisions. If you haven't walked for a while, you may have apprehension and even feel anxiety about going outside. But if you know it's the right decision and you have the faith to believe that it will do you some good to get fresh air and sunlight and move your body about, in the end, you will have to let your head rule your heart. See, we used to believe in that. Let make your head rule your heart. And bravely plunge forward. Don't spend too much time trying to get your feelings on board. I really think this is brilliant. And, you know, with him, I worked myself out of a job. He's not going to come over and, and be homeschooled because he's now autodidactic. <laughs> feelings follow faith. So put your shoes on. Get your earphones and a bottle of water. Open the door and start walking all with this steely determination that faith in that better outcome gives you. You know, that steely determination, that's where I don't want to go out in this icy cold rain, and it's, sometimes it is ice. It sounds like ice when it hits the ground. I don't want to go out there, and uh, but I steal myself because I've got to go to the mailbox. I've got to go and put the, uh, the trash bin out there for the pickup. And I've got to go over to the meeting house and do something over there. And I just steal myself. To, and I'm stronger for it. I'm healthier and I'm happier when I get it back in the warm house. So now I want to continue this. Some people have suggested that I make shorter videos. And I could do that. But I don't often have time to come and do one every single day. And when I do get set down here... I um, I don't want to make it too short because I'm the time I might not get the time back. So so now for housekeeping, let's talk about the homemaking housekeeping warm up. If you're having trouble, just in it needs something needs to be done, but you don't want to tackle it, then I would say start with the uh, warm up. You know how I've talked to you a lot about exercise and how we have a warm up exercise for beginners just real small easy things to get you in the mood and warm you up well this is what you can do go around and do some easy warm-up jobs take your I have a spray bottle full of white vinegar and I like and I get paper towels and I go and clean all mirrors and windows that you know I don't get too involved but enough to you know have a little quick success and a warm-up or I'll do some other easy thing. I I really enjoy sweeping and I'll maybe sweep the hall or sweep some in a little area. Um, just just small easy things to get you going. And there is a reason to keep house. I would like to read something to you out of the Bible and I I don't want to get in a controversy over it, but I'm anticipating there may be a controversy over this. And it is from um, it is from First Timothy 
chapter 5 and it says here but this is I'm focusing on the homemaking part okay I would have the younger widows marry bear children manage the household and give the adversary no occasion for slander so uh, previous to that it says that that if they don't marry they learn to be idlers going about from house to house and not only idler, idlers but gossip and bu busybodies saying what they should not I have cautioned people about this that even just because you're home doesn't mean that won't happen to you um, but one of the reasons to keep house is because you keep busy and out of other people's business and one of the um, what I would say uh, I don't know if I want to call it sidetracked or or it's, it's just something that can trip you up if you're a Christian because a Christian woman knows that she's supposed to you know be benevolent and hospitable and helpful and even in her own home can get distracted from the homemaking and the housekeeping trying to do things for so many other people and so I can see the I can see the wisdom in this that they are to marry manage their households now some versions say keep house and uh, manage their own households and give the adversary no occasion for slander and this is the thing as a lot of people will say I'm uh, and this this does say widows but when you look at the Greek it means young women and here's one of the problems if someone will look at a scripture like that and say well but that was to the widows uh, look if it's good and it's a good thing to do then we can aspire to it too and it says um, younger widows marry bear children manage their own households and give the adversary no occasion for slander a lot of young women not so young anymore are not marrying and having children and not managing their households because they say well that was to the widows but the fact is when it talks about widows it talks about young widows and it was assumed at the time I'm sure that most young women would would be married but this was for some that were not married because they had become widows and so we can aspire to what they is if it's good enough for them that's what I say it's good enough for the rest of us uh, marry bear children manage the household keep house give the adversary no occasion for slander if you're home minding your own business and you are uh, taking care of your house and really uh, kind of making an art out of it making like making a, a luxurious place to live and doing it in an excellent way nobody can fault you uh, but if you are not focused on the home and you get distracted in many other things you can fall into a trap and you can fall into criticism from other people of course they're going to criticize us anyway if we're at home but it's better to be criticized for doing what's right and so I uh, then I have this other thing and it is I'm at home so it's okay well being a homemaker isn't just about the location but a lot of people will say I am um, and I see this in young unmarried girls who are old enough to be married and they're home based they're living with their parents but they're out doing everything else and they go out 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 or when they're with other friends and they're gone and they're uh, not really focusing on the home but but they're still home so they can say and then they'll say something like um, well I have the approval of both my parents well when I hear that I'll always notice that the parents are somewhat uneasy about it but they have agreed to it because they sure don't want their children leaving home and getting an apartment and going where there's great danger and expense and loneliness and so they'll kind of you know shrug or put it put up with it and the girl will say I have both my parents approval and whenever they say that I know that they have tweaked it a little bit to to uh, make their parents um, approve or agree even reluctantly but what I would say 
is if you're a young woman at home and you're not married, what you should do is devote yourself to your home, make it a better place for your mother, start collecting your things for your home, and start praying, and immerse yourself in Jane Austen. And you're going to learn a lot because her era is no different than our era for the uh, for the foolish women, the wise women, the bad guys, the good guys, all the things you could, all the traps you can fall into, believing people, uh, trusting people that you shouldn't trust, and just immerse yourself in that. All the books and all the uh, the movies from the, you can even get movies that were made on these based on these novels from way back 1940s and 50s, and immerse yourself in it and learn about. If you have a hard time learning about character go into that and and analyze these characters now one of the things that uh, the education system whether it was uh, high school grade school college has done that I noticed way back in the 60s was they made reading a chore to be dreaded no one wanted they could learn to read but they didn't like it or enjoy it as much as the previous generation because it was always an assignment of a book they didn't like or uh, the stress of doing the term paper on it or reporting on it or uh, just just not reading for information or for relaxation like we used to get lost in a book lost in a story but that was back in the day you know when you you could be pretty sure the stories were fairly clean but we'd get lost in a mystery or lost in something and we enjoyed the reading we enjoyed it and we could also write our own stories and that's one of the things is they made reading a chore to dread but so when you read the Jane Austen go ahead and watch some of the movies first and then read it and then you'll figure out what's going on and appreciate it a lot more Also, I'd like to say that uh, I think you're all extremely... Uh, I wanted to say go back and say to the young girls who say, um, I have both my parents' approval, and yet their parents are rather uh, tense about the way that they are using their freedom or time, is that if what you're doing is right, it should make the parents rejoice. If the choices you're making in men or friends or uh, activities is good, your parents should be thrilled about it. They should be they should be able to sleep at night, not worry all the time, and uh, they shouldn't. If you see them uh, engaging more in um, prayer and persuasion and things that uh, and trying to um, reason with you, then you know that the decisions you're making are not really good because if you're making really good decisions as a young person it's going to put everybody at ease uh, it's not going to create tension anywhere okay so let's get back to homemaking and I want to talk about uh, we've had a lot of fun uh, in our family talking about stealth and uh, we've discovered stealth praying <laughs> stealth humming uh, making small moments uh, good and lovely just quiet moments where no one notices stealth cleaning <laughs> and uh, and uh, someone wrote me a letter and called it stealth writing isn't that nice um, so these are just fun things that I got from um, stealth camping that I, I used to watch a video series uh, channel called uh, Steve Wallace and it was stealth camping and he he has so much adventure and he'd try out new camping equipment to see how kind of report how it worked and go to these very unusual places to camp out where he wouldn't be seen and uh, sometimes he was seen and he had to pick up and move on and uh, so since they're, they don't allow me in my vital years to do that, I have to do other stealthy things and make an adventure out of it. Now I do want to warn you, uh, you ladies, if you are uh, going to homeschool anybody, and even if I'm homeschooling you, to be careful not to take the academic studies and raise them above 
the character studies. There has to be, you have to read character into everything. You can't just take a science book or a history book and um, develop a lot of knowledge on it without it affecting your character in some way. And that's one of the th things, reasons I liked uh, some of the homeschool books, particularly A. Becker was pretty good. Uh, although their, their books were general, they stimulated the students uh, interest in things so they would research further and that's what we want but you can find families that will go all whole hog what we call whole hog uh, into the intellect because children of course uh, will develop a lot of uh, interest and knowledge and something but you always got to steer them into the the uh, the character and how this is going to affect their character uh, truth and goodness and nobility and purity and loveliness and uh, 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 peace and justice and things like that. And uh, I wanted to teach you a couple of words here, a couple of things here. So those of you who are one of my homeschool students, here you go. Uh, the difference between metal and metal. Okay, I saw this on a uh, some of the comments on a article I was reading and uh, someone had said well he's really shown his true metal M-E-T-T-L-E -E, uh, which means his, his strength, his armor I think armor was called metal wasn't it but it's his true strength and someone uh, didn't know the meaning of that word and they said uh, don't you mean metal M-E-T-A-L no M-E-T-T-L-E -T -T -E and M-E-T-A-L are two different things. So if they've shown their true metal, they've shown their true strength um, and, their, and their character. Uh, and so then the other one was that I wanted to share with you because of yesterday, the last video I had where I mentioned there are some things that are just not appropriate to talk about in front of people. Um, that are personal is that uh, privacy is and I also talked about Cynthia in um, Wives and Daughters and how she, she her whole life was just embroiled in this secrecy thing she has secretly engaged Mr. Preston secretly owed money uh, secretly this and secretly that and it affected everyone around them but secrecy and privacy are not the same things we're talking about uh, privacy meaning how much you weigh how much money you've got in the bank uh, what's wrong with your body um, what size <laughs> underwear you wear uh, uh, what uh, your personal what your personal relationships are like and stuff like that that's private but secrecy uh, especially in a family are things that don't include the family that uh, aren't private but but they are done in secret to hide an intent and so there's a totally different so teach your children there's a difference between secrecy and privacy and uh, some secrecy is is good and some is not so good but privacy is what we have to deal with if you want to be refined you have to not talk about certain things um, and there is a was a saying uh, a saying years ago, back in the olden days. Silence is golden. I never understood that. Silence is golden because it gave people a, a chance to rest their brains, and we didn't have to explain every little thing down to the finest minutest detail. In fact, books that were written, you could read between the lines. Have you ever heard that expression? Read between the lines. Uh, write on on the comments sometime and tell me what you think that means when you read between the lines. Well, to me, it meant there'd be a statement in a book, like maybe even a Jane Austen books, and then it would say uh, it, nothing about it, and then we would think up the rest. It would say, um, Miss uh, So-and-so went into her garden to contemplate what had just happened. Well, then we would start to think about what had just happened. And they didn't have to explain every little detail, but it was called reading between the lines. So silence is golden and read between the lines. See if you can look that up. That's your homework. And 
So I'm, I want to move on to Linda Lichter, whom I just love, and I want to discuss a little bit of manners here from her book, and also to to use some some other things too. I, I have read more of Mrs. E. Prentice, Stepping Heavenward, really enjoying that. And I hope I get a chance to read some of that to you. But I wanted to read some of Linda Lichter. I wanted to also say to you, this book is uh, pretty severe. And I know some of you say you just love it. It's, it's not really a book to, uh, that's really pleasant because what she says is compares the Victorian era lifestyle to modern lifestyle and she's very direct about what the modern lifestyle is like and one of her chapters was like talking about how you, they took courtship of young men and women in the family off of the front porch you know where everyone could see who was seeing who and what was going on off of the front porch into the automobile and once you're in an automobile girls is uh, a very enclosed private area with no witnesses <laughs> and it's more uh, tempting to form uh, an attachment to someone uh, because you're sitting close to them and there's no one else there and so she just bemoans the fact that courtship was taken off of the front porch now every home used to have a front porch and I understand that there are people in other countries that uh, are quite fascinated with our front porch fetish that we we like to have a front porch and it's just a place to sit outside that's still attached to the house and I've often thought that if you were in a place that had not did not have the custom of front porches but you had experienced front porches and that one of your dreams was to sit out on the front porch uh, and drink lemonade or something like that uh, you could form a, a business if you could figure out how to build them and put them on wheels and uh, you'd have to have the proper vehicle to transport them to to a place that didn't have a front porch and you could either rent them or you could sell them and make front porches for all these places they're a great protection from the the elements from hot sun or cold weather or snow and they protect the front door and give a little um, less um, weather so close to the house it just uh, the front porch takes the brunt of it all but the front porch was also a place where family gathered and where uh, grown children uh, socialized sometimes the parents would be in the house and the older children would be outside on the front porch singing or sitting on the railings or you know just enjoying it being together outside so I want to read to this thing about I want to warn you too this is not for um, homeschool children uh, it's for you to read and then maybe explain it but uh, I would say if you're a married woman yes this is a good book for you it's also good for single women who have been out in the world who have dated who have uh, uh, been disappointed in how it works and want to go back to the the values of this era and now there's nothing wrong with this era it, it's actually quite biblical what they believed in and uh, and it was the reason that this era uh, we think of it as one of these you know proper eras is because it was the last one the last time we ever heard of it being done but however there are things going on in culture here in the America to restore this and you might not think that any of this will work for you, but if you have faith in it and you decide to enact it, it will work. Uh, what what they used to say, you have to plan and then work the plan. Something like that. I probably got that one wrong. And this is called Out of the Parlor. And it's on page 156. I can't I couldn't find the part where she talked about the front porch, but it was just brilliant. The key that unlocked the door uh, of the moral closet was a novel institution called dating. You don't have to be a prude to consider date a four-letter word. With the advent of this practice, women traded social power for physical pleasure. 
Feminist historians who regard women's loss of virtue as a gain in freedom should think again. And she goes on to say that calling, if, if admitted callers, in, in, in the, she compares it to the Victorian times, during uh, the previous century, it was women who, once they became of age, designated their at-home days to receive gentlemen callers. And she talks about uh, if the callers stayed too long, made inappropriate remarks, or otherwise behaved rudely, a hovering chaperone would indicate that their behavior and future visits were unwelcome. Describing how the dating system abruptly shifted power, uh, let me just tell you what it is, but <laughs> this reminded me that even today I have heard fathers who are very, very grieved and concerned about someone their daughter was seeing telling the person I don't want you to see my daughter anymore and I don't want any more communication no texting nothing I don't want her to associate with you and he'll just defy it and say oh well I'm not I'm not gonna quit you know and so uh, these fathers are uh, don't seem to have any any power against it and that that's the attitude is this attitude of disrespect towards the parents the of the girl so calling as either a simple visit or as an elaborate late 19th century ritual gave women a large portion of control first of all courtship took place within the girl's home in a woman's sphere as it was called in the 19th century uh, or at entertainments largely devised and presided over by women. Dating moved courtship out of the home and into the world outside the home and so away from the woman's power. And uh, so she goes on to say that that it undercut the control of the young women and their mothers. So you may want to read this, but like I say, it's very harsh. And while she speaks uh, favorably of the Victorian era and never uses any of the modern words to condemn it, she does not speak favorably of the current era. And so uh, she says things here that are quite harsh, and you probably wouldn't want a young person to read it unless they had gotten so worldly and so messed up that they, they would need the lecture. <laughs> and now, if you are concerned about that, I really, really recommend this movie called Princess Cut. And the reason I, I recommend it is this. I, I went through it one time and I just wrote down everything that I noticed in it. And one of the first things that they do in this movie, this is to help, this movie actually is a faith-based movie to help people get back to um, get back to what Linda Lichter is talking about courtship within the family and to encourage them and even, I've often said even if you didn't do it that way that we get as close to the model as we possibly can and and we try to uh, help the next generation avoid some of the heartache that it was caused by getting the uh, courtship off of the front porch and so one of the things that I noticed about this movie, one of the first things it opens with, kind of opens with the, the wrong guy who's standing behind a jewelry counter selling uh, jewelry, and they've dressed him uh, in a weak way. They've dressed him to look kind of weak, I think. But that's, that's the character, the whole character. But when he meets this girl's mother, uh, he, he becomes acquainted with her after he works at a coffee shop for a while. She goes in there and meets him. And when he uh, goes to her house to meet his mother, which he's not really interested in doing, but she wants him to, and he comes and uh, he calls her mother by her first name, Catherine. And you don't think much of it, especially if you're out here in the West, because they they don't call you Miss anything or Mrs. anything or Mr. at all. And uh, it was real hard for me uh, to get used to it, but there's no, I couldn't change the whole state, so I had to give up. And uh, and I call them, you know, Miss this and Mrs. that and all that, just to, you know, give the example. But anyway, he called her Catherine, and uh, I didn't think much of it until they got, you know, almost through the movie, and she, 
she, her father did not approve of this young man or any of the young men that she had been dating and suggested uh, that she and she'd had many disappointments she was actually looking to get married and she'd had so many disappointments and she, so her father and mother said why don't you just give it up give up dating give up looking for anybody and go home and and develop a relationship with your brothers and with your family well the man that uh came into her life when he was introduced to the parents he said he called them mr and mrs anderson and he called her mrs anderson there's a big difference between these two characters and the respect that he had um and he never even attempted to get grace interested in him he, he barely said hi to her but he observed her uh and she was seen instead of she, Previously, she'd been in a coffee shop with a noisy group of, of young people. She'd been in a car with a boy. She had been in a house visiting another young man. And she, she knew that she was going to, it was putting a lot of stress on her to live this way. And she knew she was going to have to change something. So she went to her parents and they said, why don't you just stay home and uh, make uh, a relationship with your family and wait for God? And, of course, her girlfriend makes fun of that. I thought you were waiting for God, you know. And uh, so the young man that is uh, presented in, he's more mature. He's rather formal. In fact, he sounds like a lawyer when he comes to talk to the parents. He's so formal. And uh, he never makes any uh, attempt to get her interested in him at all until he passes it with the parents and said would it be okay if I developed a friendship with her uh, with the idea in mind that that we might be able to get married and if not we could still remain friends and it's because of that respect that the father agreed to it and it made the parents happy and that's why I told you earlier on here if you're a young woman at home and you're doing things and and in activities and having friendships that make your parents uneasy and you're saying well I have both my parents approval if if you are doing the right thing the parents will rejoice and they will be very happy at your decision and so there should have been a nice workbook that went with this movie but i did i did have someone watch it that was in a culture that has left this kind of thing long ago he said that it wouldn't work it wouldn't work there at all and that uh they were just amazed that anyone thought that that this this would work but you know what we can start from the home my daughter did it and we can start from the home just one home at a time it doesn't have to start from the top or from the state you know saying it's okay or from the uh the movies influencing us but uh it was done in such a nice nice way a humble way and and so I would recommend you watch this, especially young girls have already dated, who've already been disappointed, or who have gotten caught up in the world to watch this. Now, they'll make fun of it at first because it is so nice. And uh, if you're jaded, you laugh and make fun of things that are innocent and sweet. As a matter of fact, now I have another book to talk to you about. I had one of my descendants over one time and... He asked me why I, uh, he said, why do you and mommy um, uh, feel so strongly about the way young men's appearance is? You know, why, why, do, you, why do you feel so strongly about uh, their grooming and how they, how they dress and how they stand and how they present themselves? Because doesn't God look on the heart? And I said, yes, he does. But I want to tell you that the way you present yourself has a lot to do with your heart, has a lot to do with how you're thinking and how you're feeling. And, and it's a reflection of your, um, your attitudes. And I said, uh, just a minute. And I actually had the bookshelf, some of it cleaned up so well that I could actually go to this particular book. It used to be, I would like, oh, well, I can't even find it. Don't even know where it is. But it was called Man and Demand. And so I flipped him through some of the pages and the way they have taught is through drawings. Like a contrast. Uh, the way that young man is standing, is not confident, and then shows the uh, shows the reaction of people and the opposite. And, and just, you know, different things like your expression and your posture and things like that and and uh and your cleanliness and i showed him all this and i said this is the reason your 
your your grandmother and your mother are so particular because they grew up on this I grew up on this and I think the girls should have a copy of this too this is man and demand the other one was uh, the other one was uh, Christian charm of course they're both written by the same person Wayne and Emily Hunter I would not get the revised version of this try to get this old copy here which is uh, kind of a hot pink red um, but the women, the young women should have a copy of this too so that they know what to expect of a young man. They should have a copy of this and read this too. And um, so I let him read it and it was talking about different things like homing your hair, about taking care of your, uh, your weight, your complexion, your posture, the way you talk to people. It's all in here and they've done it through drawings which I think is really effective. Sometimes people won't read. <laughs> this is, was my favorite. What, looking at this guy, these people, uh, you know, showing the difference between people who stick their feet out and let people trip over you, and rocking back on a chair, and then sitting properly. And so I just left it there, and he's in his room where he was staying. And he came to me the next day, and he said, "You were right about that book." He said it was a good book. I guess he stayed up late and read the whole thing. And he said, um, and because of what I saw in there, I got up this morning and I shaved and I combed my, washed my hair and combed my hair. And um, he was wearing a button-down shirt and uh, and a belt and everything. And so it did it did have an uh, effect on him. But now the 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 jaded worldly person would laugh all the way through it, and that just shows. That just shows how far gone you are if you're going to make fun of things like this and things like this and, and this here. Just how just how um, worldly you've become when you start. Now, that I admit there are some things in some books and some teachings that are just a little too, you know, uh, not, not enough to be taken seriously. I understand that. Uh, so ladies, and I hope this has been a good adventure for you today, and I want to do one more thing, and that is on manners, is not to hold people captive uh, with a long, boring story. And you can teach this from a very early age, and what, the great thing about this uh, broadcast is you can pause it and stop it. I'm not holding you captive. You can just stop it anytime you want. Wouldn't that be nice to have a pause button for certain people? <laughs> Don't hold people captive. They're, most of them are too polite to put a stop to someone who's being very aggressive um, and cornering them. And I've seen this at oh certain gatherings in, in my home and other people's home where there'll be somebody that has a, a motive or uh, an agenda that wants to change uh, an opinion or something and they'll get them in a corner and talk to them quietly and you and, and you can't get away because you can't get out or they'll get you get you at the door and you can't leave and uh, so so for you um, a short simple answer is the best thing some people cannot be reasoned with they they'll want to talk and talk and talk but they don't want you to talk so the best thing to do is start out with us with a pretty good explanation if you can and then start to shorten it if you if you don't like what they're saying and if you're objecting to what they're saying and you want to get away and they're one of these long talkers you can say uh, I'm not ready to do that yet but thank you for the information and they keep talking and you say, you'll say, um, uh, I appreciate your interest. And then they keep talking and you say, uh, no, thank you. And then they keep talking and then you shorten it and you say, uh, thank you. Uh, and then you say, no. And finally you say, no. And then you say, no. And then you escape. Um, but it's so sad that we have a, a culture that requires us to to have to dodge these kind of people because back in the olden days we had Andy Griffith and we had Carol Burnett and they would make fun of some of these people who weren't really aware of the effect they were having and they had these cranky people or these people that uh, dominated a conversation and they would make a comedy out of it and of course we would look at it and think Ooh, I don't want to be like you know so and so, and we become more conscious of our own uh, manners and behavior. Well, we haven't had 
really good comedy in a long time. Um, but we can make our own. And ladies, I hope that... Uh, I, I suppose I've offended everybody today, but I hope that you've benefited from it in some way and uh, that you'll stay close to Christ, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.